Good morning. We can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. In 1962, Dr. Martin Luther King delivered a lecture here at Vanderbilt Law School. Entitled, The Ethical Demands for Integration, Dr. King passionately about the vital role that the law plays in addressing what he called in his speech, the race problem. Let us never succumb to the temptation of believing that legislation and judicial degree, decrees play only minor roles in solving this problem. Morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. Judicial decrees may not change the heart, but they can restrain the heartless. The habits, if not the hearts of people, have been and are being altered every day by legislative acts, judicial decisions, and executive orders. At the same time, Dr. King observed that law has its limits. The law can only go so far in bringing about true racial justice. We must admit that the ultimate solution to the race problem lies in the willingness of men to obey the unenforceable. A vigorous enforcement of civil rights laws will bring an end to segregated facilities, but it cannot bring an end to fears, prejudice, pride, and irrationality, which are the barriers to a truly integrated society. Those dark and demonic responses will be removed only as men are possessed by the invisible inner law which etches on their hearts the conviction that all men are brothers. Dr. King's observation that law is one, but only one, of the disciplines or tools that can facilitate racial justice serves as inspiration for this symposium, which is transinstitutional, involving four Vanderbilt colleges, multidisciplinary, involving law, divinity, education, and all of the disciplines reflected in the graduate school, and fully collaborative. And it is my pleasure this morning to open our proceedings. My name is Chris Guthrie, and I am the dean of Vanderbilt Law School. On behalf of the law school, I'm delighted to welcome you to this symposium a symposium that is devoted to Dr. King and to the continuing struggle for racial justice. The symposium is the brainchild of my colleague, Dean Emily Towns of the Vanderbilt Divinity School. Several months ago, Dean Towns reached out to her counterparts at the Graduate School, the Peabody College of Education and Human Development, and the Law School to propose that we co-host this conference as the deans of the four schools at Vanderbilt that became the first to desegregate. I therefore stand in front of you this morning because of Dean Towns and because of three African American students who had the courage to enroll at Vanderbilt Law School beginning in 1956. That year, the law school welcomed its first two African American students, Melvin Porter and Fred Work. Melvin Porter was an Army veteran and the former student body president at Tennessee State University. He graduated from Vanderbilt Law School in 1959 and moved to Oklahoma City where he opened a successful law practice, served two terms as the president of the Oklahoma chapter of the NAACP, and became the first African American ever elected to the Oklahoma State Senate. Melvin's classmate, Fred Work, enrolled with Melvin in 1956 and graduated with him in 1959. Upon graduating from Vanderbilt Law School, Fred moved to Gary, Indiana, where he became city attorney, a two-term city judge, and the first African American to be nominated for statewide political office. And in 1962, Janie Greenwood Harris, a Phi Beta Kappa mathematics graduate of Fisk University, became the first African-American woman to enroll at Vanderbilt Law School. Following her graduation, she worked for three federal agencies, held leadership positions at regional and national banks, and was appointed by the United States Secretary of Labor to serve on the U.S. Advisory Council on Employee Benefits. As a law school, a university, and a society, it's clear that we have made a lot of progress in the half century since Melvin, Fred, and Janie attended Vanderbilt Law School. But it is equally clear that the struggle for true racial justice, the inculcation of the 
invisible inner law that holds that we are all brothers and sisters continues. Today it continues here under the leadership of Dean Emily Towns, whom it is my pleasure to introduce. Emily is the Dean and the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Professor of Womanist Ethics and Society at Vanderbilt Divinity School. Dean Towns joined Vanderbilt from the Yale Divinity School where she served as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and held an Andrew W. Mellon Chair. Among many other honors, she is a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Science and she is one of the most accomplished scholars and leaders at Vanderbilt University. Please join me in welcoming Dean Emily Towns. Thank you, Chris. I owe you a drink. <laughs> Today, I am most pleased to be joined by the deans by Deans Benbo, uh, Benbow of Peabody, Guthrie of Law, and Wallace, who sends his regrets. He is in an unalterable and most unfortunate conflict today, but he does send his greetings and wishes he could be with you, or with us. Also, Vice Provost of Inclusive Excellence, Melissa Thomas Hunt, and Vice Chancellor of Equity, Inclusion, and diversity, James Page, Jr. We represent, as Chris has told you, the sponsoring schools and offices of Vanderbilt University, the law school, the divinity school, the graduate school, Peabody College, the Office of Inclusive Excellence, and the Office for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. A little over a year ago, I suggested to Deans Guthrie and Wallace that as the three deans of the first schools of Vanderbilt University to admit black students in the 1950s, to be precise, in 1953 in the Divinity School was the beginning, that we collaborate on marking the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. by jointly sponsoring a one-day symposium by our three schools. They enthusiastically agreed, which is one of the reasons why I like working at this university, the collegiality between all of the deans. And when we announced that we were doing this at our next dean's council meeting, Dean Bembo pointed out that although Peabody College was not a part of the university in the 1950s, it too admitted its first black students in that era as well. So we enthusiastically welcome the inclusion of Peabody. As we discussed the possibilities of focus, Dean Guthrie was the one who suggested our theme, from MLK to BLM, a half century of struggle. And we were off and running. In this last year of planning, Vice Provost Thomas Hunt joined in the collaboration. And shortly after the arrival of Vice Chancellor Page in August, his office office joined our symposium sponsors as well. Many folks have worked to put this symposium together, and I will name as many as I can, and if I leave you out, it's only because my memory is not good. From Divinity, Shatika Brown, Sophia Agtarot, Teresa Smallwood, the incomparable Teresa Smallwood, <laughs> Phyllis Shepard. From Law, Chris Myers, Jim Rossi, Faye Johnson, and Robert Dorch from Peabody, Anna Cristina de Salvo Iddings from the Graduate School, Don Carlos Brunson, from uh, the Vice Provost's Office, Tiffany Green and Alicia Brandiwi, from the Vice Chancellor's Office, Tiffany Terrell, Jermaine Soto, University Communications, Anne Marie Owens, Marketing Solutions, and among the many students, who are actually too numerous to name, um, but Erica Johnson, Ariana Wagner, and I think there's one other person that's Quentin Cox, and some more. <laughs> the panelists have, will be introduced throughout the day, and our keynote speaker, speakers, Dr. Mina Pratt-Clark of Virginia Polytech Institute and State University, who will speak at lunch, 
and Ms. Patrice Cullors, who is a co-founder of Black Lives Matter and an activist and author in the evening. Some might say that the phrase, it takes a village, is passe these days. I beg to differ. It has taken the creative genius of a great number of people to put this day together and to breathe life into this symposium. I thank each and every one of you for giving your time and energy and deep intellectual and emotive swag. <laughs> I invite you in the audience to engage in the Q&A time. I now ask that Vice Chancellor James E. Page, Jr. come to the podium. As he comes, let me say just a bit about him. Prior to joining the Vanderbilt community in August, Vice Chancellor Page served as Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for Johns Hopkins Medicine, where he oversaw all diversity and inclusion policy and planning across multiple hospitals, healthcare groups, and the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Vice Chancellor Page also worked with Dell Incorporated for more than 10 years, where he led the company's global diversity, global ethics, compliance, and privacy organizations in the US in, and in 116 other countries. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> Vice Chancellor Page, it's my honor to bring you to this place. So I just wanted to take a moment to, uh, to say uh, uh, thank you for allowing my office to be a part of this uh, 50 years after Martin Luther King's um, uh, death. It's interesting because I was talking to some folks the other day about um, the importance of this moment and reflecting personally about my family and who I am and, and why I find this work so important. I was very fortunate. I grew up in a house, um, mom and dad were always there. Uh, raised in the uh, amazing city of Indianapolis, Indiana, but grew uh, born in the, uh, the uh, Louisville, Kentucky, not too far from here. And we had one of those homes where um, grandma took care of everyone as they were aging. And uh, one of the fortunate um, uh, ancestors that I had the fortune to um, constantly interact with in my grandmother's house was my great-grandma, Grandma Mary. Grandma Mary died in about 1983 or uh, two, somewhere around that time frame. Uh, but she lived to be 107 years old. And I got to spend a lot of time with Grandma Mary. And it wasn't until much older that I start doing the math. And, and you take uh, uh, 1983 and you take 100 away from that and you're about a 19, uh, 1883, then you take a couple more away from that, and you're, you're bumping right against the time of, uh, of slavery. And to think of the lessons and the stories that she taught me, the fact that she lived a lot of what we're dealing with right now. And it's interesting as we think about Dr. King, because one of the things that Dr. King said is this, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in times of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in the time of triumph uh, a controversy and as I think about where we are at this moment it is a time where it is complicated we are in a place in our country where we do need to acknowledge that behaviors of systematic racism and bigotry are bubbling up but I will also say that I don't think it's the most challenging time that our country has ever faced as I think about some of the things that Grandma Mary went through to help me get to where I am at this moment, I realize that despite however dark it is, and we can't quite see those stars, that I still stand on the shoulders of giants that came before me. And as we think about Dr. King and where we are at this moment, I think it's a really important time that we have to acknowledge the truth, that we're not where we should be, but we also are not quite as bad as things have been in the past. So while we fight through this moment and acknowledge the, 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 the behaviors that are deplorable that are taking place at this moment, let's never forget those who came before us that have, create, that have created a path to help us be able to sit in this room together and have these conversations which at one time would have been enough to get some of us um, hurt if not um, uh, uh, killed. 
So with that, I want to thank you for allowing me to take these couple of moments, allowing me to be part of this amazing community of Vanderbilt, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you as I step out of my um, uh, neophyte time of three weeks and enter that experience moment of four weeks where I know everything about Nashville <laughs> and <laughs> Vanderbilt. Thank you very much. So we begin the panels. The first panel of the day is organized by the Divinity School. Our panelists are Dr. Anthea Butler, who is graduate chair and associate professor of religious studies and Africana studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a historian of American and African American religion. She's also author of Women in the Church of God in Christ. Making a Sanctified World. Dr. Vicki Crawford is director of the office of the Morehouse College Martin Luther King Jr. Collection. She is a civil rights scholar and author of the groundbreaking Women in the Civil Rights Movement, Trailblazers and Torch Bearers. Dr. Eddie S. Glaude Jr. is the William S. Todd Professor of Religion and African American Studies and Chair of the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University. His books include Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul, and In a Shade of Blue, Pragmatism and the Politics of Black America. Currently, Glaude is at work on a book about James Baldwin tentatively titled James Baldwin's America, 1963 to 1972. And the Reverend Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman, who is Assistant Professor of Theology and African American Religion at Yale University Divinity School. She is a first career concert dancer whose first book is Toward a Womanist Ethic of Incarnation, Black Bodies, the Black Church, and the Council of Chalcedon. She is currently working on two monographs, tentatively titled Black Women's Burden, Sexism, Violence, and the Black Church, and Loves the Spirit, the Womanist Theological Idea. The panelists have been asked to consider the public theology and racial justice implications of the death of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr in the context of our current social and cultural situation in which the racially charged deaths of blacks at the hands of police, quasi-police, and other hate groups is voluminous. Specifically, how do we focus the discourse, the conversation, towards exposing the evils inherent in the system systemic responses to those deaths to motivate participants to envision new strategies for eradicating racial injustice, illuminated by the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. They have been asked, pleaded to, <laughs> and I will be the timekeeper for, to keep their remarks to 10 minutes, knowing they no will words. get more time no. later. <laughs> I will be a benign dictator, <laughs> but I will dictate. Knowing the panelists, I think they have decided what order they're going yeah, to go in. Did. So I'm going to leave them alone on that. <laughs> and I believe it's uh, Vicki, are you? Yeah, serious? I think it's me. <laughs> Thank you. Let us begin. Okay, good morning. Can everybody hear me well? Okay, thank you, Dean Towns. This is a wonderful opportunity to be here at Vanderbilt and uh, to meet you. Uh, your work has been so very important to me uh, in my study of African American women's lives, so I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Recently, I had an opportunity to visit the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, and also the Legacy Museum uh, that is titled "From The Black Experience from Enslavement to Mass Incarceration. I don't know if any of you have uh, visited the museum uh, in Montgomery, uh, but uh, and the founder of the museum is Brian 
Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative. And while I was very familiar with this history and the history of lynching and Jim Crow and segregation uh, as a civil rights scholar, I was not quite prepared for the palpable experience of visualizing all of these many names and list of names of people, children and women and men who had been lynched and tortured um, from the period after Reconstruction through 1950, over 4,000, I think, um, you know, the EJI has documented it, as well as Tuskegee University, over, over 4,000 lynchings in this country. And these, of course, are the lynchings that we, we know about. Uh, so to visualize those names and to see the names of entire families and communities uh, listed by county, uh, listed by state, and not just in the South, uh, but in the South, in the Midwest, in the North, it's, it's really compelling. Uh, and it really has me thinking a lot about history and memory uh, and the power of, of, of this, this, this uh, history and how we have to remember. Um, Sherilyn Eiffel, and, and I agree with her, of the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, has written a book titled On the Courthouse Yon Alon, Confronting the Legacy of Lynching in the 21st Century. And she argues in that book about why it is very critical that we have this public space and these memorials to get the conversation started, to talk about and to confront uh, this racial uh, injustice in this racial history in this past. We recognize, and this is what has really, I left that memorial really thinking about this, and that is, and you all know it, that we recognize that the kind of violence that we're seeing today and the kind of racial terrorism we're seeing uh, is directly in many ways complexly linked to what we saw in the past, that current forms of state-sanctioned racial violence, mass incarceration, the rise in hate crimes, and the marginalization of the poor uh, and black and poor people of color has a tie to, historically to this era. So in reflecting on the theme for the symposium, from Martin Luther King Jr. to Black Lives Matter, I have been thinking about the ways in which the past shapes the present and how historical consciousness and collective memory can be critically important agents for social change and transformation. That the act of remembrance is powerful. Uh, and as we take stock of this history of violence and human destruction, I also want to remind us that we need to take stock of the history, the long memory, as uh, Mary Frances Berry called it, the long memory of resistance to this kind of injustice, the culture of resistance that you find in African American communities. People survived it. They survived it and they organized. And so we, we also want to remember the countervailing history of resistance uh, that goes all the way back to the inception. Black people coming to this country have resisted and it continues to the present day in the form of the movement uh, for black lives. So, I've been thinking about history and memory, and I want to focus on two areas this morning. First, in keeping with the theme, I'd like to reflect a bit, bit on Dr. King's uh, last five years, uh, what Cornel West calls a radical king, and other people talk about the radical king, but we also know that King talked about these ideas as early as 1954, 1955. Uh, but I want to reflect on his last years, and in particular to talk a bit about his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, a powerful title, open question, one that still resonates with us today. I want to talk about that last book published in 1967 during his lifetime. Uh, and in particular, I want to look at the last chapter of that book titled The World House. Uh, and in that chapter, King talks about this concept of a world house. And I want to dwell on that just a bit uh, in the first part of what I want to say today. And I want to consider, secondly, the relevance of that concept for us in today's time. All right? And then thirdly, I ask the question, how might we engage King and others in the black freedom struggle as we envision new strategies in addressing racial injustice and other forms of violence and human destruction? 
Half a century ago, uh, in Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, King wrote that while society had witnessed some significant scientific and technological advances, conversely, human progress had improved very little. King reflected on the global challenges of his time, and he warned that persistent injustice would ultimately threaten the survival of all humanity. In that last chapter, Dr. King identified what he called the triple evils, the triple evils of racism, of poverty, and of war, the, the evil triumvirate, as is talked about. And King warned that if we did not deal with the evil triumvirate, that we threaten uh, all of humanity uh, would be threatened. In terms of the evil triumvirate uh, in the World House, he said, quote, and I quote him, we have inherited a large house, a great world house in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interest, who because we can never again live apart, must learn somehow to live with each other in peace. Our hope, he said, for, the cre for creative living in this world house that we have inherited lies in our ability to reestablish the moral ends of our lives in personal character and social justice. Without this spiritual and moral re reawakening, we shall destroy ourselves in the misuse of our own instruments, writing in 1967. In terms of racism, he clarified that racism is not just an American phenomenon, that it is a global problem, and he spoke about that, again, as early as 1955, making those connections. He was particularly interested in what was going on um, in Asia, in Africa, um, during that time. Uh, he talked about poverty. Uh, he elaborated that he could, we, we had to uh, find an end to poverty, that there's no reason in the world why we, the people, uh, should be without food and without um, the ability um, to, to have sustenance, and that if we fail to do that, that would be another detriment uh, in terms of realization of the world house. And finally, he talked about militarism. Uh, and we can talk about that in today's time, uh, how we had to find an end to war, the war was obsolete. And he used various terms to talk about the world house. He called it the beloved community, which we know about, the kingdom of God on earth, the new world order, lots of different terms that he would use interchangeably to talk about this world house. I want to suggest that while King articulated this concept over a half century ago, that there's some pertinence uh, as we in it as we confront the era of Donald Trump and his agenda and the rise in state-sanctioned violence, police violence, and mass incarceration. Since two, 2016, we have seen a steady increase in white supremacy, unmasking as we saw in Charlottesville, uh, resurfacing there and other places around the country. The Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery tracks hate crimes, and you go to their website and look at their material, uh, and they document the proliferation of these hate crimes all around the country. Um, and we also see in our public spaces and in our institutions uh, increases in all sorts of microaggressions, macroaggressions, and I'm sure we, we in a conversation many of us can talk about being personally touched by, by some of this. Uh, a rising culture of incivility, mean-spiritedness, and xenophobia, among other uh, isms that we're facing. So my question is, how might we reanimate King's World House vision and deploy it in our current social justice work? What can we learn from others who lived and worked with King as we set about envisioning new strategies for building a stronger humanity? How can we make creative use of their work and how can we learn from their successes as well as their failures? So first I want to elaborate a bit on the act of remembrance and bearing witness and truth telling. The work of remembrance is important, I think, to recognizing the continuities of struggle and the ways that new movements are similar yet different. I am reminded too, I've been thinking a lot about Vincent Harding who came to Morehouse in 2012 and taught a course. Vincent Harding was a close colleague uh, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr's. And Vincent Harding wrote years ago in a book called There is a River, he talked about the metaphor of the river and the, and the, the continuum of struggle. And so I am reminded of that here again, that there, uh-oh, already? <laughs> I, ju I just got it. 
Okay, well, let me hurry up. Okay, there is a long <laughs> history of resistance to white supremacy. So let, let me quickly, let me, I wanted to talk a little bit about, let me quickly say, memory. Did she cut me off? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to cut your mic. I'm just cutting your time. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, I, I just want to say a bit, and I, and I will quickly move forward, uh, how we disremember the history of the civil rights movement or the black freedom struggle. And one of the ways we do that is that we have not included women. Uh, and a lot, a lot of my work has been on the role of women in the movement. Uh, and that has been pretty much absent from history. And we, we, that does a disservice to everyone when we disremember or when we uh, marginalize or leave out a whole group of people who were very important in struggle, in organizing, in mobilizing, and sustaining a movement because we get to learn from them. And a current generation, uh, as a generation who's organizing the movement for black lives, do, do not get an opportunity to benefit from that work. And so I talk a bit, quite a bit about the absence of women in the narrative, the absence in uh, people, uh, gay people, the absence of, of the work of youth and young people, that that's got to be in that history. And one book that does that recently is Jean Theo Harris's new book, uh, A Beautiful and Terrible History. Uh, where she's talking about the narrative of the civil rights movement and interrogating that master narrative. So I wanted to talk a bit about El Ella Baker, and perhaps we can do some of this in conversation, Dorothy Cotton, and people who work with Dr. King and other people who made a difference in that movement. We have so much to learn from, uh, from them. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Towns, um, for the invitation to participate in such a significant conversation. I am very, very excited to be here today with such a distinguished all-star lineup of um, co-panelists, and I echo the collegial sentiments that have already been shared. It's very interesting for me uh, to think about the ways in which the two 2018 50-year commemoration of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is genealogically positioned in relation to the 2019 400th anniversary of the arrival of 19 kidnapped black Africans to the Virginia shore, namely the Jamestown settlement, which though many of us forget or perhaps never knew was an Anglican colony. Although estranged by approximately 350 years, the proximity of these two memorials is traced along one fault line, namely black death. And in commemorating both historical moments within the span of two consecutive years, it's clear that neither event can be read completely outside of the other. The physical, spiritual, geographic, environmental extinguishing of black life is not only the result of the theological centering of the European and the necessary displacement of non-European others as systematic theologian Willie Jennings advances in his Christian uh, imagination, theology, and the origins of race, but also and equally important as the result of social and ethnological myth-making that is always working in tandem with the theological. This, of course, is the wheelhouse of a theopolitical ethic and or social ethics as a discipline that we see mined in the work of black womanist theologians and ethicists like Emily M. Towns in her constructive contention of the fantastic hegemonic imagination and Kelly Brown Douglas' examination of Tacitus Germania in her strong gesture toward the religion of whiteness. The religion of whiteness casts very simply, white men as God. I should say, white um, uh, heterosexual in public men as God, white women as the brides of Christ, and white children as their cherubim. This distortion of the gospel has colored our civil engagement. It is a theology of the state that codes all that is white and approximates whiteness as honorable and blackness as dishonorable in ways that compel the incessant persistence of black death grounded in the chauvinistic particularity of the American mythos. 
When I consider the meaning of King's assassination for the task of public theology today, it is black death that rises to the top for me. But it's important to note that black faith uh, in its prophetic and compensatory uh, manifestations has always had to wrestle with this. This is nothing new. Intercommunally, blackness often supersedes gender, class, and sexual social indicators, and I'll return to this problematic in just a few moments. But echoing James Cone's final meditations on this movement, this moment rather, in the movement for black lives, suffice it to say for now that black blood is the connective strand across the multiple registers of blacknesses, male, female, trans, non-binary, gay, straight, bi, polytheist, non-theist, this is the blood, all of this blood is disproportionately crying out from the ground um, to the black public theologian. It is crying out, where is your kin, in ways that echo Genesis 4, but deviates insofar as it demands a response that affirms black life, or as one might uh, endeavor to move away from the theophallic imagery of crucifixion and blood, uh, it asks the question of black breath and its uh, perpetual asphyxiation in the public square and positions this question as the central question uh, for, uh, coming from my particularity, the black and black womanist public theological task in light of the varieties of death that carried black bodies to U.S. shores 400 years ago, even as the complexities of African enslavability and indigenous genocide get completely disappeared in contemporary liberal immigration mythos, as well as the varieties of black death that continue to shoot black bodies down like, as West would say, dogs, not only in the street, but as we have seen in the past couple of weeks, the past couple of months, and the past couple of years, in their homes and churches, regardless of black adjacency to white respectability, and even while, and still holding black death or the black dead responsible for their own demise. The task of the public theologian today is to articulate, confront, and resist the many forms of black death, as well as the God and gods of whiteness, and to profess, not just imagine, a black Christ who's not only on the side of the oppressed, who not only dwells with them, but who is in their very bodies. The oppressed body is God's body, and God's body is the oppressed body, not in the theotic sense that makes gods of the oppressed, but in the phenomenological sense of God being there, infleshed. And the praxeological implication of that thereness for those of us who claim to live in celebration of an empty tomb, right? Because you cannot get there to Easter as in Hezekiah Walker's when we all get there, when we get over there, without first attending to the crucified bodies and their concomitant descent into hell right here. This vision of the oppressed body as God's body is the womanist, liberationist fundament for gospel-aligned Christian theological justice-making practice and proclamation. In this moment, when outright lies Racism, misogyny, narcissism, greed, ruthlessness, self-centeredness, name-calling, punitive retaliative mechanisms, and braggadocious self-suprematist motifs. I am legion, for I am many. Illustrative of the highest low-down office in our nation right now. In light of all this, it's really hard work. And in positioning myself to consider uh, new strategies for the eradication of racial injustice on the one hand, my immediate and honest response is I do not know how to get white people to stop killing black people, period. I don't know. I mean, blacks have tried everything, and whites who are aligned with blacks as freedom fighters and accomplices, we have tried everything from theological arguments to moral ethical arguments to scientific arguments to outright rebellion, nonviolence, 
repatriation, legislative measures, marching, sitting in, dying in, kneeling in, not to mention just plain old prayer, hymn singing, and fasting. I think the question of new strategies for eradicating racial injustice, if not properly deployed, can be unfair. It can be short-sighted. Uh, it can lay the onus of racial justice making at the feet of black people. And I'm frankly tired of blacks having to clean up white messes. It is a black domestic lie. On the other hand, <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay. <sighs> On the other hand, I could offer some responses um, that are for sure useful, right? Um, as it relates to eradicating, working to fight against racial injustice. Um, for instance, voting, right? Or as uh, Dr. Crawford has pointed out, um, the um, significance, um, the critical significance of intersectionality for the work of justice making. And of course, in making such an assertion, uh, I have to account for black feminist counter arguments like that of Jennifer Nash that contends that intersectionality is actually not a useful project at all, or even the work of black womanist theological ethicist Carrie Day, who presses up against the boundaries of or the limits of intersectionality toward the usefulness of assemblage in the queer theory of Jasbir Puar, emphasizing the fluidity of identities that uh, that uh, cannot find continuity solely based on structural injury and or materiality. I don't buy either of their arguments wholesale. But in my comments uh, above regarding blackness intercommunally superseding other social indicators like gender, class, sexuality, ability, and so on, there is a way in which intersectionality allows, if nothing else, for us to think about the ways that oppressions very simply are interconnected and that we really cannot be liberated from the one unless we are liberated from them all. Mm -hmm. And even though we know that Dr. King's final campaign in Memphis uh, was inspired, and several others along the way, uh, for sure, was inspired by, for instance, the black women at the Scripto Pen Factory, black women factory workers in Atlanta who were on strike for higher wages and who helped crystallize for King the need to connect the demands of labor and civil rights that would become the catalyst for his poor people's campaign for economic justice that led him to Memphis in the first place. Not to mention, for instance, Maxine Smith and Lori Sugarman, the women whose club work mobilized the Memphis NAACP to be the largest in the South at the time of the Memphis strikes. Or even uh, Gladys Carpenter, the veteran marcher uh, who, whose cry, he runned over my foot uh, when she was assaulted by a cop car, prompted the first direct acts of police retaliation against the Memphis move it, movement that would propel King um, uh, further down his uh, road toward room 306 in the Lorraine Motel. Um, this is part of the stratagem of the black of black social gospelers that completely um, that they completely flunked that is uh, uh, leaving the women out right? Uh, black social gospelers completely got this wrong and they continue to flunk it contemporarily. There is something meaningful about thinking about how race and gender and class and sexual oppressions are linked and can only be effectively eradicated when we are fighting for them all. Um, I could say more here about social media and its use for virtue, you know, its use for mass and lightning speed mobilization, uh. but I'm going to finish with this. <laughs> The most important question for me, very quickly, Dr. Towns, is not so much what we can do um, to fight racial injustice. As I said, we've been doing it. We have to continue doing it. The most important question for me is how do we approximate living fully now among the mess? Mm. How do we hold on to joy, love, hope, and, 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 and ourselves in defiance of the pessimism that demands the new millennial death of our God who is black? Thank you. Whenever one is confronted with a benign dictator, you need other, <laughs> other modes of accountability, so I'm going to put my phone on.
That's called networking. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Dr. Towns and everyone who made this possible. I'm really honored to be on this panel. Uh, so I'm going to just jump into it because my time is limited. Um, in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, Dr. Crawford referenced this earlier, Dr. King argued, among other things, that white supremacy stood in the way of democracy in this country, that it was an ever-present force in America frustrating the dreams of the nation's darker citizens and undermining any, any pretense to racial justice. He wrote, quote, Negroes have proceeded from a premise that equality means what it says, and they have taken white Americans at their word when they talk of it as an objective. But most whites in America, this is King now, proceed from a premise that equality is a loose expression for improvement. White America is not even psychologically organized to close the gap. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it seeks only to make it less painful and less obvious, but in most respects to retain it." End quote. Now, King did not draw this conclusion from some abstract set of ideological principles. Instead, his was a conclusion drawn from the intense experience of challenging racial segregation in the South and of confronting a nation that, no matter its stated commitments to democracy, supported the underlying beliefs which sustained that form of life. Dr. King came to understand, and this is often obscured in our yearly celebration of him, our invocation of him, the depths of American racism. He had underestimated how deeply rooted white supremacy was in the habits of American life, how the transformation of the heart he so eloquently preached about since the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott required a fundamental change in the practices and structure of the country, change that could not depend solely on the moral conscience of white people, no matter black people's willingness to sacrifice and suffer because of, that invest because of their investment in whiteness. In fact, in August of 1967, Dr. King stated plainly, quote, the vast majority of white Americans are racist either consciously or unconsciously, end quote. Now, this commitment to the idea that white people were superior to others distorted the principles of democracy dis and disfigured the moral character of those who believed it. King had seen it up close in the contorted faces of sheriffs in small southern towns and in the ferocity of the young white toughs in Cicero, Illinois. He remained committed, however, throughout to the moral power of his call to the nation. He never stopped being a preacher after all, but he now understood that something far greater was required if America was in fact to be redeemed. Now I've spent a lot of time thinking about this passage from where do we go from here. In some ways King's formulation hinges on a devastating judgment about our national commitment to racial justice. He claimed that the country viewed the idea of racial equality as a loose expression for improvement. When thought of in this way, racial justice gets reduced to a charitable enterprise a philanthropic practice by which white people do good for black people. Mm. For him and for me, that is not equality. Who are you to give me freedom? I don't understand. In fact, such an approach reflects the underlying problematic that haunts the nation in matters of race. Just think about it. Here we are in 2018, and we're confronting a wide range of protests and, and the reality of police brutality, particularly against black and brown people, while walking black, driving black, sitting in your own apartment while black. Right. Colin, Car and, you know, Colin Kaepernick and others in support of those who demand equal treatment under the law decided to take a knee and now he's unemployed. Um, and now before the horrors of Las Vegas and the devastation of Hurricane Maria, we want to invoke that in this moment, uh, in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, President Trump at a campaign rally in Alabama, you remember, took issue with the protest in the NFL and, and with passion urged the NFL owners to fire the SOPs. Now, bracketing where you might stand on the question of protest during the national anthem, what was fascinating and horrifying all at once was the response among some of Trump's supporters. Joe Walsh, the former congressman, declared that the rich football players were ungrateful. <laughs> and this sentiment was echoed across social media platforms. This idea of gratitude is striking here. It reveals that for some, particularly some white people, folk, the success of black NFL players had little to do with their talent and dedication to their profession, that they haven't worked tirelessly to reach the highest level of the sport. Instead, they should be grateful for the opportunity to play. This idea of gratefulness extends to black students on college campuses. You know this at here at Vanderbilt, right? We heard this in response to Princeton students protesting the name of Woodrow Wilson, the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy to various workspaces black people occupy. I hear it all the time. I should be grateful to be here at Princeton, right? 
just to give you a sense of how odd this formulation is, imagine someone saying to a hedge fund manager on Wall Street, you should be grateful that you're allowed to make all that money. Right? It's a formulation reserved for certain kinds of folks. Now this example, these examples illustrate that the, the truth of King's insight, that the truth of King's insight in 1967 still obtains all of these years later. For many, for many white Americans, the idea, of racial, any, the, racial, the idea of racial equality is understood as a form of charity, something to be given away. Now what this philanthropic approach reveals is something more fundamental. Remember Dr. King referred to a gap that white people are not psychologically organized to close. Now I want to suggest that here King refers to the fundamental problem at the heart of our national malaise, what I call the value gap, a belief that white people matter more a belief that adjusts and adapts to different material conditions. But the value gap cannot be thought of as simply the product of loud races, folks who are shouting the N-word or saying Mexicans should go back to Mexico. Right? That again is too easy. It is too easy to condemn the white nationalists and neo-Nazis in Charlottesville without understanding how our daily choices and actions, the habits that guide us, give them life. The value gap is not about loud races. It cuts much deeper. All Americans are shaped by biases, stereotypes, and the history of racism in this country that incline us to treat certain people in certain ways. We are shaped by what I call racial habits, and those habits shape not only our lives and personal choices, but the policies we create that reinforce the value gap. And any of you who've read Aristotle, you know habit talk is character talk. Mm -hmm. Racial habits are the ways we live the belief that white people are valued more than others. They are the things we do without thinking that sustain the value gap. They range from snap judgments we make about black people that rely on stereotypes to the ways we think about race that we get from living within our respective communities. Both show how we account for the persistence of racial inequality today. Now let me try to make this more concrete with a historical example with the four minutes or three minutes I have left. Am I, are we consistent? Three. <laughs> On April 14, 1876, at the unveiling of the Freedmen's Monument in Lincoln Park, Washington, D.C., Frederick Douglass delivered his oration in memory of Abraham Lincoln. And I was struck by a particular passage. Let me read it to you. It must be admitted, truth compels me to admit, even here in the presence of the monument erected in his memory, Abraham Lincoln was not in the fullest sense of the word, either our man or our model. In his interest, in his associations, in his habits of thought, and in his prejudices, Douglas Rice, he was a white man. He was preeminently the white man's president, entirely devoted to the welfare of white men. First and last, you and yours were the object of his deepest affection and his most earnest solicitude. You are the children of Abraham Lincoln. We are at best his stepchildren, children by adoption, children by forces of circumstances and necessity, right? End quote. James Baldwin will pick this up later on, right? Douglas acknowledges the exalted place of Lincoln in the history of the nation, but makes explicit the limits of his character, that his commitment to the belief that white people mattered more than others distorted his moral vision and blocked the way to the attainment of the kinds of excellences his ideal of democracy required. This belief that white people mattered more, what is the value gap, what I call the value gap, rests at the heart of this nation and confounds us at every term. James Baldwin wrote, America sometimes resembles an exceedingly monotonous minstrel show. The same dances, the same music, the same jokes. One has done it for so long, or been the show for so long, that one could do it in one sleep, end quote. Here, in 1876, Frederick Douglass exposed the insidious work of the value gap. And here we are in 2018, and we continue to confront how it deforms our characters and our democracy. In other words, Douglass was saying to Lincoln, you can't even become the kind of man that your conception of democracy requires precisely because you are so invested in white. Hmm? And so when Black Lives Matter says Black Lives Matter, we know that. We're not talking about us. We're actually saying that white lives don't matter as much, right? They don't matter more, right? And so part of the work of our, con of our contemporary moment, and I'm coming to a close, is that we can read the Black Lives Matter movement as the latest instantiation of an attempt to address the value gap and the habits that give it life. And if we're going to become the kind of country that's committed to democracy, we have to become the kinds of people that democracy requires. And that's going to require something that Dr. King realized uh, on the day that he was murdered, or before. Right. I'm done. <laughs> Had a lot more.
much more to talk about. <laughs> Mm. Mm. Uh, there we go. Okay. Exactly. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Towns, for inviting me. I want to start in a different place than everybody else started. I want to start off with the death of Mike Brown. Because if we're going to talk about Black Lives Matter, that's where we have to start. And I want to talk about where I was that day. I was not in America. I was in London. And I was watching this unfold on social media. I'm right now in the midst of a project working on social media and Black Lives Matter and the work of black women through Black Lives Matter. And it was an unfolding horror to me because the ways in which Michael Brown's body had been laid out on the street bleeding in the hot sun reminded me so much about what the history of America was and still is. It is a history of violence. If there are two words that exemplify America, it is violence and racism. I don't hear the sounds of the Star Spangled Banner. I heard something different. And so in that foreign land where I'm watching all of this unfold, all I could think was, I wonder how other people around the world are going to see this. Because we focus so much on ourselves mm. that we don't really see how the world sees us. We are a barbaric place. We are a broken place. We are an unredeemable place. And if we think that we are in the promised land, as what King said the night before he was assassinated, this is not the promised land. This is a desolate land. This land has no life. This land has no feeling. This land has no place. This land started with slavery and indentured servitude. This land started with stealing. This land started in blood. And until we come to that moment of realizing that the things that our forefathers and foremothers fought for to be a part of this place are not the things that we should fight for in the first place, then we will get to see where we need to be. So I want to start off there because it's easy to think about King as a lofty person, as someone who did all of this because he wanted to be part of what the promise of the American project was. But see, if you had told me this conference was about Malcolm X and Black Lives Matter, I would have been down for everything. Now that sounds very radical to say here when we're talking about King, but we have to look at another vision too. This vision of America that we have been sold by white supremacy, that we have been sold by Christian white supremacists who have married the flag and the cross in this inner marriage of shame and degradation to black people, brown people, yellow people, all of this thing that we, that we have been told that is wonderful is not wonderful. It is a travesty. And until we understand this, we cannot understand what the eventual project is because, you see, there will still be shootings of black men in cars who can legally carry their Second Amendment right gun. Because, see, the gun alongside the flag and the cross are the symbols of America. The gun is here to keep you in check, to keep your blackness there. And so whenever the police yield a gun, like they did on Michael Brown and Ferguson, and we see the beginnings of the movement to come out of Ferguson of people marching every day, and the, and the ways in which all of those people who came out, who got tear gas, were saying, this is wrong. But you saw on the other side a black state trooper who prayed with the police every night before they tear gas people and shot them with rubber bullets, then you have to begin to question what was this thing that King and other civil rights movement leaders were fighting for. They were fighting in part for freedom, for equality, but they were also fighting for a dream that didn't, would not ever exist in this country. And until we realize that that dream is broken and it has never been a dream but it is a nightmare, then we need to come to grips with what can we do going forward. 
because I'm fully convinced that the ways in which we remember King now, and I'm saying this as somebody who studied with a King scholar at Penn, at here, at Vanderbilt, Louis Baldwin, who knows the words of King. And I have to think about this in a different way now. Because now what we see is a complete repudiation of all of those dreams. We are in the second, we, we are in the second redemption. We don't want to face that, but we are. And this redemption is being led by a president who believes that anybody who is not white is wrong. And that you are the enemy. And so when you face that, when we start to face that in the light of Black Lives Matter and the light in which that we have not seen a, a reduction in deaths from Trayvon Martin, there is a litany of names that we could say. All of these names that come before us and we haven't seen any change. There's no change in the police systems that are there to keep constricting us. Where we have white people who think they should police a kid who's selling lemonade or black people who are engaging in a barbecue, when every white person can be a policeman now, it's really tiring. And I'm gonna say something that's gonna be hard for you white people in here to hear, but I want to say it to you, because you're sitting here because you care, but I need you to know that I'm tired of y'all. I need you to hear that, because we don't wanna fight for this thing anymore. Why should, you know, I came in here thinking, maybe the first thing I should do is, is a, question to you about this is maybe we should just leave because I think about it every day. I am like Baldwin, I am like Wright, I am like all these other people. I realize I have privilege. I don't have to stay here. I don't want to stay here with you because I don't know if this is worth fighting for. Is it worth fighting for to be with you? And so I want to challenge you today because we put together all these things for you all the time. It's really great. You come off feeling good in your liberal self. But like Thomas Martin said, liberals are the worst people for civil rights. Because you continue to inculcate those same things that have been inscribed upon us. And so what I want to leave you with today is, is that it's not simply enough to think about the legacy of King and what is going on with Black Lives Matter. The problem is, and the question is that you are left with is, is this worth fighting for? Is this the thing that we want as a nation? How is it that the rest of the world has seen civil rights and decided to go to anti-apartheid movements, to Tahir Square, to Buddhist monks burning themselves, and they all see something in this movement and this nation has not moved? That's something worth thinking about. We don't live in this small space of America. We live in a global world, no matter what people try to do right now to make this place small, the rest of the world has moved on and we look like Neanderthals. So if this is going to be about anything, if this is going to be about democracy, if it's going to be about how can we get black people on the same part, how can we have civil rights and how can women stop being abused and all of these things that need to be done in this country, we need to realize that our country is broken and that the things that these people were fighting for are not the things that ex exactly exist right now because we are not a great nation. We are a fallen nation. We are a nation that has not dealt with its original sin. Our God is a racist God, and that is the God that America worships. Thank you. We are actually at time for this session, but I want to take convener's privilege and say um, we will continue for another five minutes with any Q&A that you have from the audience. And I also want to thank our panelists. We chose wisely. Any questions? And I would ask, there's a mic here and a mic there. If you would walk to the mic because we're taping and um, that's the only way we'll be able to hear your question. 
Go ahead. We can pass them out as well if someone should okay. stay at their seat. Hi, y'all. This was so incredible. Thank you for your time and all of your powerful thoughts and words. I'm from the southern border along uh, the U.S. and Mexico, the Rio Grande Valley, and we've been dealing with a really intense period of violence against Mexican immigrant and migrant bodies, mainly by way of child separation and the internment of children migrants in essentially concentration camps. I'm curious as to, in the intellectual spheres that you all inhabit, what is the dialogue around this injustice that's coming up against brown bodies, specifically the child separation? And how does that fit into the grand arc of the fight for civil rights that we've been discussing this morning, in your opinion? In my opinion, um, I don't think my colleagues have done enough, to be honest. I mean, I think this is a conversation that we have had in various ways. And since this has been very new and a lot of this rolled out during the summer, it remains to be seen how this works. I mean, there are a lot of people who have been out in the press right now. I think. One of the things for me in terms of religion is I'm really appalled from my personal tradition of the Catholic Church that I have not had bishops out there laying themselves out in front of these places every day. I think that the religious response has been horrific and that is, is problematic for me. I, I think that when I say America is not great, this is one of the things I'm talking about because we don't want to deal with the fact that we have internment camps for people right now that we have internment camps that exist in states like Texas. This morning on the news, there was just Arizona who said they're closing up all these places because there have been child molestations there. This, this is untenable and unconscionable. And one of the things I think is really interesting for me, and I you know, apologize because I realize everybody has a place in what we can do. Some of us can be in the streets. Some of us can do other things, and I'll close really quickly, is that I wrote about this summer about the issue of dissent and protest. And I, you know, referenced my colleague's book about this. And I said, you know, one of the things that we don't want to do is give up our bodies. And I think one of the lessons of the civil rights movement is that people gave up their bodies in service of the movement. And that we have been so concerned with the killing of black bodies right now that we also forget that there were people who were willing to give up their bodies and their lives for that. And I wonder if we don't need to get back to that again. It's really important to see that the, the current immigration policy is really bound up with a certain kind of crisis in whiteness. Uh, there, there, there is the reality of the demographic shifts that are taking place in the country that, that have, in fact, happened. Um, and immigration policy is driven, I think, in very clear ways uh, by uh, a deep-seated anxiety uh, around the role of whiteness. In fact, they made it very explicit. Trump made it explicit about immigration in Europe, and then he came back and made it explicit here in the U.S. Um, so I think when the connection, right, is precisely in the way in which we're, we're trying to critique how a certain understanding of whiteness, right, distorts a certain set of commitments and principles and distorts a certain way of being in the world. It can make us monstrous. I happen to know a lot of white people, and I happen to love a lot of people who happen to be white. It's a distinction that Baldwin makes that I want to kind of sit down in at some point, right? And so there are these moments of, of, of connection as we see, um, in some ways, the last gasp, at least this instance, in this instance, of a certain kind of white supremacy, perhaps. Uh, and I also want to just emphasize, I think this goes to much of what Dr. Butler has offered this morning. Um, I want to emphasize that we ought not be shocked by what's happening at the border. I mean, what has been done, um, most especially within the context to your question of um, African-American religious studies, broadly speaking, is um, is, is this uh, mining of memory as well as truth telling and our telling this story of the ways in which children have been separated from their parents and families, the ways in which children have been um, uh, 
uh, held in camps, in uh, the ways in which our children continue, continue to be held within the plantation economies of the prison industrial complex. We have been telling this story. This has been happening. And so I think how we move forward is to, to what I stated. So, so, this is, so, so we can't cover that up. I say, oh, well, what are you saying about what's happening at the border? We've been trying to tell y'all about what's been, what's been happening in borderlands across this nation. So what, what we ought to do, how we ought to be thinking about moving forward is, I think, um, right on target with the idea of assemblage, with the idea of intersectionality. How do we bring our stories together to tell a story about the oppression of non-white bodies in this country so that we can build a strategy for resistance together? rather than being distanced from one another based on pigmentocratic politics that want to position us uh, in opposition to each other, black and brown bodies, based on who is closer to whiteness. Because um, anti-blackness is a reality in brown communities too. And so, Trayvon, right. And so, so I think that, um, I think that African-American religionists, broadly speaking, have been speaking to this. We've been telling this story. We've been trying to get people to listen. And we're going to keep telling the story. I'd ask us to thank the panel once again. Our break lasts for 10 minutes, and the next panel will begin promptly at 10.30.